This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Hello and welcome. I'm Mary Walshock, a professor of sociology and the associate vice chancellor for extended studies and public programs here at the University of California, San Diego. As the Dean of Extension, I've also spent much of my time focusing on regional economic development, providing lifelong learning to thousands of working adults, and helping to found Connect, which builds high-tech companies, and the cross-border collaborative, San Diego Dialogue. I also launched UCSD TV, extending the resources of the university into the San Diego community and beyond through broadcast and the web. And tonight, as UC San Diego celebrates its 50th anniversary, it's my pleasure to be your host for the final edition of UCSD at 50. We start tonight in much the same way that UC San Diego began 50 years ago, with the physical sciences. When UCSD's founders recruited a Nobel laureate in chemistry to this fledgling campus, top faculty and graduate students in math, physics, and chemistry soon followed. And their innovative research and education over the last five decades have fueled UC San Diego's rapid rise to national and international distinction. As you will see now, this legacy of the future continues in UC San Diego's Division of Physical Sciences. The legacy of the Division of Physical Sciences started in the vision of the founding generation in chemistry, physics, and mathematics, among the first departments when UC San Diego was established 50 years ago. They were people like Harold Urey, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering deuterium, and who brought some of the first moon rocks to UC San Diego, where the first chair of the chemistry department, Jim Arnold, revealed many of their secrets. Or people like Maria Mayer, the second woman in history to win a Nobel Prize in physics for work that determined the structure of the atomic nucleus. Or Margaret Burbage, an astrophysicist who helped determine that we all really are made of star stuff. And Martin Kamen, who discovered carbon-14 used to date fossils and archaeological artifacts. Or George Fair, a physicist who developed a new form of spectroscopy and used it to understand the details of photosynthesis. Or Stanley Miller, whose famous experiment with Harold Urey that created the building blocks of life from simple chemical ingredients still resonates today. Or Bernd Matthias, who made some of the most seminal discoveries in superconductivity. As it has over the last half century, this legacy of research and education continues to shape the future today. In Brian Maple's physics lab, the future is superconductivity. Superconductivity is a, a property that many um, metals have, and what happens is as you cool them below a certain temperature, which is called the superconducting critical temperature, the electrical resistivity vanishes and goes to zero. And by zero, I really mean zero. They become uh, perfect conductors of electrical current, where you can take a superconducting disk and then place on top of it a permanent magnet, and that magnet will float or levitate above the superconductor. Our dream is to make a superconductor that will go into the superconducting state at or above room temperature, in which case, you know, the world as we know it would be dramatically changed. We spend a certain amount of our time prospecting, so to speak, for new materials. We want to perturb them profoundly because we want to alter their uh, properties. We want to basically rearrange the electrons in the solids, make changes in their crystal structures that might reveal a new property and enhance certain, say, superconducting or magnetic properties, properties that will be 
uh, different and interesting uh, and useful in some cases. I'm pretty sure that as we look at more and more novel materials that we can't even dream about at this point, it's probably a good guess that eventually we will get a room temperature superconductor. Mathematics has been called the queen of the sciences, and that is never more true than today at UC San Diego. Mathematics is becoming increasingly important in a variety of fields. One of the areas, for example, is how do you do simulations? How do you try to understand the world around you? If you look at biology, uh, it's all about systems biology. And to do that, you have to have physical modeling, you have to have simulations of the cell, and those require basic mathematics. So this is one of the areas where the mathematics of algorithms of trying to understand how simulations work is absolutely important. So we have quite a strong group in what's called scientific computation. We have people developing software that's used by international companies like Boeing. We have people who are trying to develop numerical algorithms to understand the internet. If you're going to finance more and more, algorithms are driving the financial decisions that banks make. In addition, we have great strength in pure mathematics. The department's been fortunate enough over the years to have three different fields medalists, which is the highest prize in mathematics. It's equivalent to the Nobel Prize in mathematics. So we have a, a department um, that has incredible strength recognized by the national community. In a unique facility, chemist Stanley Opella combines disciplines, using physics and chemistry to look deeply into biological processes. This is a very specialized facility. As you can see, it's an air-supported structure, and that's because we have these high-field magnets in here. So we do an experiment called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and it's used to solve the structures of proteins. The purpose is of biomedical research, and we're using the nuclei as a monitor of the chemical structure and the chemical function, and it's been found to be a very reliable way of looking at the structure and dynamics and interactions of biological molecules. Our major research interest is understanding the most fundamental properties of membrane proteins. We're developing the NMR method so that it can look at the proteins in the membrane bilayer, which is their natural environment. We're interested in the structures of the molecules and actually the electrons that form the bonds and interact with other molecules. Uh, like metabolites or drugs. Half of all drugs in, that are used in medicine bind to proteins in the membrane. So we need to understand these membrane proteins as chemicals. We need to look at the positions and the vibrations of every single atom in the protein because all these phenomena are fundamentally chemical phenomena. The future truly belongs to the students of UC San Diego and the unique environmental systems major prepares them to grasp it firmly. The unique aspect of our program is the breadth of courses that our students take. They all have a disciplinary expertise that could be earth sciences, chemistry, environmental biology, or policy. In addition to that training, they have training across those disciplines. So all our students will have a good background, a core training, in all of the natural sciences and additionally economics and policy. These are challenging times for California in general. We have a lot of environmental challenges coming up. They all have an economic and policy component. We need the kind of leaders that can tie all these areas together. I think society is really depending on having interdisciplinary problem solvers like our students when they graduate. So we require all of our seniors to, to go out and to solve an interdisciplinary problem and this is something a project that is designed by the student and that's uh, very unique. Some examples are students that we have who are looking at developing atmospheric sampling techniques that can identify trace compounds and to identify sources of those compounds. We have a lot of students who are involved in stormwater and stormwater prevention and stormwater education. We have students who are working in our natural reserves and conservation biology projects. It's certainly true to say that there's never been a time when it's been more important to do the work that we're doing.
California is poised to have a leadership role and to have innovative technologies. Our students, the ones that we're training here today, are really going to be part of our economic growth in the very near future. How does this legacy of the Division of Physical Sciences ensure this future? The founding generation of this university were, were incredible. I mean, they had this vision to, to, to build a great university. They had this commitment of absolutely no compromise on trying to get the very best people that they possibly could. Those sorts of absolute commitment to trying to be at the cutting edge of knowledge to train the next generation of students the best way we can are things I think we've done incredibly successfully here. And I think if we maintain those commitments for the next 50 years, we're going to go to even greater heights than we have here. Hi, I'm Fernando Nasratpour. I work at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps, and I'm the aquarium curator here. Aquarium work is part science, it's physical, it's a little bit of engineering because we do some plumbing work and pumps, uh, but then there's the creativity, the art part of it, where we get to decorate it and aquascape it, as we call it. A typical day at the aquarium, we're doing a lot of rounds. We're making rounds of all the tanks. Uh, we're looking at all the fish to make sure they're healthy. You have this really close relationship with them. You understand them better. They get to know you better, so when you walk up to an exhibit where you're ready to feed, they know it's you. I really enjoy the animals. I like to see the progression of exhibits that we put together and how they grow and mature. All our work is geared toward making the front of the tank look nice, and yet a lot of visitors are interested in what's going on behind the scenes. The aquarium behind the scenes, it's catwalks and tanks, and you hear bubbles and water flowing and filters and pump noise. So it's a lot of these kind of things. And we're standing behind tanks, we're cleaning windows, we're feeding the fish from there. So I'll be jumping in our coral tank, it's 1,200 gallons, and basically what I'm gonna do is go in, look at the health of the corals, get a close-up view. And because the corals are growing well, sometimes they kind of bump into each other and they can sting each other. So we don't want that. So I'll be going in and clipping some corals so that there's space between them, they don't sting each other, and those are become fragments that we can trade with other public aquariums later. Most people don't scuba dive. They don't get to see the ocean firsthand. And so this may be the only place where they can go and they don't have to get wet, they don't have to spend the money on scuba equipment, and they can see all these animals and just get a little taste of what it's like out there. But to see it firsthand behind the window of an aquarium is, I think, an awesome experience. John Malachak approached me, we'd met and worked on a small collaboration previously. And so he had said, I just have this new project, I'm working with the museum, wouldn't it be great to have four walls of projection for this show? Little did he know of the technical, logistical, artistic complexity that that would bring. The Dreams and Diversions exhibition that the San Diego Museum of Art had kind of commissioned John and uh, his team that included me to make this piece that would somehow connect for an audience, kind of uh, create a public performative and um, contemporary vision of artists being inspired by these prints. And it had to be its own artistic work in its own right that, you know, I was kind of given the um, real honor of attempting to reinterpret these prints um, from these Japanese masters. didn't you know, want to reenact no traditions or kabuki traditions of the period, that that really wasn't our world and it's a different cultural time, a different cultural place. And so we decided that we wanted to do a series of artists, contemporary artists, um, traveling, uh, in this case a dance company on tour, and the different stops along the road, the same way the prints re uh, reveal the Takaido Road and other both spatial and kind of temporal and cultural movements throughout Japan. Part of 
of my challenge as a designer on this project was to figure out how to connect these um, block prints from another time and culture to our contemporary world. And so one of the solutions that I found was actually looking into the history of how the form, shape, line quality, texture were used in the original prints. How they then were used by Western artists like Van Gogh and Toulouse-Lautrec and all these major um, uh, and Impressionist artists, Western Impressionist artists, you can see that there's a direct lineage in how space, line, and form are used. And that, for me, was one of the keys for how to um, bridge both of these two worlds and, and make a connection. go to the movies, uh, you know, you pay your ticket, you sit down, and you only look at one big image over the course of two hours. For something like projection design, it's kind of rethinking and reconceiving how we use uh, moving images. For this project, it really is envisioning moving images that can be seen with live performers. As an artist, it was really important to me that the projection be a supportive element, that it create an emotional tone and environment, but that the main focus during the dance sequences was on the, the action in front of you. There was this real intimacy that was available to us that in a traditional proscenium stage isn't always there. So I felt like part of my job was to create visual images that would support that and build over the course of an hour. My background as an animator allowed me to kind of know some of the tricks that I could use to create images that would have very subtle movement over time, that would present an environment, an emotional tone that could be moving, moving very slowly and transforming over four or five or ten minutes, but that weren't, again, like a cinematic moment where you go in, you sit down, and it's, you know, flashing lights, moving imagery the whole time. I don't want it to have the same quality that you have as like a jumbotron at a sports arena, right? Where you're kind of looking up here at the jumbotron to see the instant replay and then looking back down here to see the live action in front of you that of really um, combining those two worlds. And to me, part of the excitement of this field is being able to combine those two worlds. Great speed, great line. Syntax from cinema doesn't work particularly well when you have a live performer in front of you. Fast cutting, for example, right? Intercutting, all of a sudden, that whole vocabulary we have of shot, reverse shot, shot, reverse shot um, becomes quite problematic when you have a live person standing in front of that. So what kinds of languages can be evolved um, to, to accommodate having live performance and video together? It's one of my central interests as an artist. From aerospace, mechanical, and bioengineering, to structural, nano, electronic, and computer engineering, the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego is known for its stellar research. But the Jacobs School of Engineering's most important product is its students. 
To fulfill its mission of educating tomorrow's technology leaders, the Jacobs School offers several model undergraduate programs that foster innovation and leadership and teach not only engineering, but teamwork. The school's Global Ties program brings together undergraduate engineers across disciplines, creating teams to provide for the needs of others. Right now we work with a nonprofit Gawa Kalinga, which their goal is to end poverty in the Philippines by 2024. A big issue in the Philippines is water contamination. So we want to be able to give these people a safe drinking water system. Currently we are working on a design that's known as a biosand filter, which requires no kind of no kind of energy whatsoever. It filters the water through a system of uh, sand, gravel, and a biolayer, which forms after running the system for a while. A biolayer forms on the top called smudge deck, which kills all the pathogens. You get that experience, the industry experience, and that experience of working with a team, and you learn that team interaction, how to deal with problems, and um, how to solve problems with a team. So it's been a really, really fulfilling experience. What we're actually doing is giving students a rare opportunity to apply their skills to a real project with a real customer where they have to come up with a real deliverable. We're trying to instill in students the humanitarian spirit, the sense that you can do well, but you can also do good. Ties open my eyes so that I can combine my passion for helping people and my passion for engineering into one career path. And we all kind of collaborate together and come up with the ideas, and when we actually implement it, we get the chance to learn from each other and learn from different majors. This program has, such, has had such a profound uh, impact on uh, my own view of, of what engineering is in my desire to, to be an engineer and, and to contribute. The Team Internship Program, or TIP, is part of the Jacobs School's effort to enhance the students' education through real-world engineering experiences in a team setting. Students work on-site with industry partners, both domestically and internationally, as a multidisciplinary team focused on a clearly defined and significant project. The students have a really unique opportunity when they join the team internship program. And I tell them it's like a regular internship in that it's paid, you work at the company, and it's during the summer. Then you go beyond that, it's not like a regular internship and that the students are working on a team. The team internship program approached me and said, you know, Viasat loves to do team programs. Um, would you be interested in being part of a team instead of just doing a solo project? They just put me on a team um, of people that were also going to Viasat and that's how it began. The fact that they're on a team makes it even better because if they don't know something, they can turn to their teammate and be like, um, I'm not really sure. And maybe that person actually has expertise in that area. And if we ever needed anything, just turn around and start talking, you know? And we had two whiteboards in this little cubicle of ours. And um, anytime there was ever a disagreement, we could just start, you know, talking about, well, why do you think this way? Why do you think that way? And in the end, we would always come to a consensus. It's a really great collaborative environment that the students can really um, come up with something successful and tangible that they can then put on their resumes and be like, look, I don't only know my stuff, I can do it. And what I really learned from this experience particularly was that when you go into industry and when you go out into the workforce, it isn't about what you know. It's about how you can communicate what you know and how you can understand what other people know so that you can make progress on a project. In another project with outside industry partners, Jacobs School undergraduate engineering students work together to create innovative and groundbreaking products for real-world applications. This is a lab that was founded as a partnership between National Geographic and UCSD. And uh, basically what it is is it's undergraduate students working on projects that are actually going to go out into the field and make exploration easier for National Geographic explorers. Basically this is an aerial video platform um, that would be a much cheaper alternative to a helicopter in the field. So this device was built to actually hold a camera, which sits uh, underneath the housing right about here. And that camera um, has a live feedback, so a camera person sitting there operating, and all the time it's recording. And basically we're able to get uh, images of lots of things that before were sort of left out of the realm of possibility in the field. And this, thing, this whole thing um, folds up into a backpack and can charge in about you know, an hour or so to get in the air. And our flight time is between like 15 and 20 minutes. I will be accompanying uh, Albert Lin, who is a research scientist at UCSD, I'll be going with him on a trip to Mongolia to look for the tomb of Genghis Khan. Essentially what we'll be doing is using this as a photo generating device to try to generate images from the air. 
And ideally, if we collect enough data, we'd like to build a 3D map of this whole area. The applications of this, I have to say, extend you know, far beyond just getting a couple pretty pictures from the air, which people have been able to do for a while now. But if you can envision you know, maybe 30 of these things communicating in the air and flying sort of in like the flying V pattern or in a cloud pattern, your, your point cloud of data grows exponentially. It's to the point that you're getting enough data to actually do viable real-time research with it. And the fact that these projects are actually going to be go out and be deployed, not just by you know, students with, with an idea to go out and deploy it, but with an agency that's, that's you know, so universally recognized, um, that's very interested in the data that we're collecting, I, I, it's, it's lit a fire, I, I think, under the students' involvement in this program. In celebration of UCSD's 50th anniversary, Chancellor Marianne Fox challenged students, staff, faculty, and friends of the university to each perform 50 hours of community service with the hope of reaching 50,000 hours collectively. Starting with a beach cleanup at Scripps Pier, volunteers gave their talents and time working with organizations throughout San Diego. Some picked up a paintbrush, some planted flowers, some pushed brooms, but everyone walked away with a sense of pride. The year-long project was a resounding success. In all, the Volunteer 50 program uh, has the UC San Diego community contributing more than $1.4 million worth of volunteer service. Together, our volunteers donated more than 60,000 hours of your time and energy, 60,000. Congratulations to all the volunteers. UCSD's anniversary events may be winding down, but the themes we celebrated this year will continue. We had a green open house this spring, showcasing the campus as a living laboratory for sustainability. Some 4,000 people from throughout the region spent the day with us, learning about local growers, water-wise landscaping, the environmental cost of plastic grocery bags, clean and green cars, and some creative ideas for alternative energy. All of these reflecting UC San Diego's commitment to a healthy people and healthy planet. This is the final edition of UCSD at 50. I'm Mary Walshock. Thank you for your interest in UC San Diego. Please come visit us on campus or online. From all of us at UCSD, we hope you've enjoyed UCSD at 50. UCSD is by far the most successful university that started in, in the last 50 years. And part of the reason for that is an absolute um, commitment to excellence. This is both in teaching, research, and service. And that commitment to excellence, uh, along with a commitment to explore interdisciplinary things, has really made this a very unique place. If I look toward the future, I think those are the principles that will push UCSD forward in the next, in the next 50 years as well. Mm -hmm.